everything to me. Quintessential Jamaican boy, hard exterior, just like we like our boys, unforgiving like black men are supposed to be. I adored him. Frugal with his love as well as his money, his affections were conditional. I loved everything he did and he loved him some Kenny Rogers, so I love Kenny Rogers too. For nine years, he was my only reflection. Both of us brown, both of us abandoned by our mother. Him with lighter skin, his hair straighter than mine. But we were similar enough to see ourselves in each other. Both hurt enough by the world to fiercely love each other. He loved me grudgingly. I adored him like an eager pup loves a reluctant owner. In charge of everything we did, he made me sing country music like we was born and raised in fucking Memphis, Tennessee. We spent whole afternoons begging Ruby to take your love to town. We were singing daytime friends and nighttime lovers like all drunks reliving tragic lives. He loved the gambler most of all. You gotta know when to hold them. Know when to fold them. Know when to walk away. Know when to run. He sang the gambler like he was Kenny Rogers himself. I couldn't understand why the boy loved that song. But I would have followed him anywhere. So, to please my brother, I sang the gambler with gusto. Then our mother returned and separated us sent him to Mount Salem, left me in a place called Paradise, and disappeared. The distance between my brother and me, only two miles, might as well have been 2,000. We became single children of Sisyphus, pushing the rock of abandonment of disparate mountains. No more Kenny Rogers, he switched to reggae. I listened to Melissa Etheridge, Sarah McLaughlin, Michelle and Deggie Ocello. We both tried so hard to remain close. But our love was never meant to survive, never meant for holiday dinners and lasting relationships. Our life was marked for infrequent, awkward reunions laced with sorrow. We lived every day pushing against our deep desire for love, needing people but guarding against it. Such is the delicate wiring of emotional dysfunction. The few good times we had were complicated, rare. Magical. Circa 1999, we found compromise in Mariah Carey, speeding 100 miles on the autobahn. Windows down, we sang into the cold night. Felt so alone, suffered from alienation, carried the weight on my own. Happy as I was, I remember thinking, being a lesbian will one day cost me my first love, my brother the only boy whose opinion of me ever mattered. I needed this boy to love me, but I also needed him to know me. So I took the chance, baited fate, and told him all about the girlish collisions I had on campus, the tacit lovers who went with me to illegal house parties up in the hills in Jamaica, the pretty girls residing in the smallest closets on campus. I couldn't be silent anymore about any of them. I told my brother everything about the boys who assaulted me, about their hands and their fingers and their fists. He listened as I talked statistics, the rate at which they were killing people like me in Jamaica. Frightened and resigned to losing him, I told him, I am about to be out like a motherfucker. And my almost twin, both of us discarded by our mother, both half-breeds, both seeds of my mother's ill-conceived youth, only two years apart, my brother, who had no reason to, he told me he loved me. My Jamaican boy, raised on a stout diet of violent homophobia, said, use my sister, so it don't matter. And I didn't quite know how to show him how lucky I felt to be his sister. I wanted to sing the gambler right there and then. <laughs> but the moment wasn't right, so I just promised I would love him forever. I believed then that our bond would survive everything. We loved each other hard as we could, ill-matched as siblings, witness to each other's pain. We developed a routine of sustainability. Whenever we disagreed about anything, my brother would mostly walk away, and I would mostly not let him. At each fracture, 
I would remind the boy that we was all we had, that we had survived our mother, that we could survive anything. So the last time we argued, I was surprised at how swiftly the tables turned without warning. You never see these things coming. In an instant, we were children again, forced to make beauty of tragedy. The house of cards we'd constructed so carefully collapsed, and unable to find a way forward, we both folded, bound and broken by all we had endured. We found ourselves unable to hold each other, angry and intractable. My brother walked away. My big brother walked the fuck away, and this time, I let him. It's painfully poetic that the contention we had was about our children. This irony proves everything about parenting and progeny. Generational trauma cannot be sidestepped. Today there is almost nothing but sadness between us. I know nothing of his life. He knows nothing of mine. Our childhood is no more than a silent scream, except for the odd memory triggered by an old playlist cartwheeling me back to us as children, unwittingly belting out our future. You gotta know.